Okay. All right, and we are live now. Hello, we're Matt and Judd. We're the founders of Nomic. Um, we've been working on Nomic since 2018, and uh, our mission is to bring Bitcoin to Cosmos. And we're really excited to tell you about exactly how we're doing that. So in this talk, by the end of it, um, I hope you leave with a clear idea of um, how Nomic works, um, why it's secure and some of the security properties we've chosen for it, and also have a clear idea of how you might use it to add Bitcoin to your own chain. So Nomic is the Cosmos Bitcoin peg zone, which means that it's a Tendermint based um, <clears throat> side chain of Bitcoin. And it adds this new asset called NBTC, which is pegged one to one uh, with regular Bitcoin. So the basic idea is you deposit Bitcoin into the side chain and you get an equivalent amount of NBTC. Uh, you can transfer that NBTC to another account, to a smart contract, whatever. And then you can withdraw that NBTC uh, to get main chain Bitcoin again. So uh, this diagram sort of shows an overview of the two networks and how they relate to each other. So on the bottom, um, this is the Nomic network. Uh, so the validators of this network are cooperating to manage funds that are held in a single big multi-sig script uh, on Bitcoin. And uh, they will cooperate to contribute their signatures um, to this single big transaction that's built on chain. And then sort of in the middle of the two networks is this relayer process that will uh, transmit that transaction when it becomes valid to the Bitcoin network. And it will also uh, watch for new blocks on Bitcoin and relay their headers uh, back to the Nomic network. So um, now we'll sort of give you an overview of how the peg actually works and, and what it's doing. Cool, thank you, Judd. Yeah, now we'll just go into sort of the internals of how this is integrated with Bitcoin since that's kind of the tricky part here. So uh, yeah, if you can see this, this is Bitcoin script. So I feel like most people haven't really looked at Bitcoin script a lot. Like you've probably seen Solidity, but not a lot of Bitcoin script. And uh, you know, most people think Bitcoin can't do smart contracts. Well, it's very limited obviously, but you can do a lot. And so this script is actually checking that a transaction is verified by, or is authorized by a certain Tendermint validator set. So if we look at all these little sections here, each one is just checking one by one uh, each key in the validator set. And if they authorize it, it adds their voting power. Then at the very end, it's just comparing to make sure that more than two thirds of the voting power has signed off on it. And so, you know, most people think of Bitcoin multi-sig as just like a simple two of three or something like that. But this is, you know, more complex than that. It's actually checking for two thirds voting power. And also a common misconception, people think Bitcoin multi-sig only supports up to 15 keys, but um, that's just the, the multi-sig opcode, which we're not actually using. So we can support up to 76 keys today on Bitcoin. So that's already a close approximation of a validator set. So if we zoom out one step, um, all of these here are Bitcoin transactions. And so we have this periodic process we call checkpointing, which um, basically the network, they take all the outputs. So like all the spendable Bitcoin controlled by that script we just looked at and the validators uh, sign a transaction that spends all that and uh, moves it to the next validator set. So like, you know, as the validator set is changing, as people are bonding and unbonding, we're updating that on the Bitcoin side. Um, if you look at the diagram, the top left there, that's, you know, Alice and Bob making deposit transactions from their wallets. And uh, we collect those and move those into the reserves. And if you look at the top right, there's dispersals. So that's Carol and Dave withdrawing to whatever Bitcoin script or Bitcoin address. And, um, you know, we create outputs. We're sending money to them. So if we just zoom in on this bottom part, just the checkpoint transactions, that's where most of the money lives. It's sort of just this big blob of Bitcoin moving along as the validator set updates. So a really cool thing we can do with that is uh, use that to actually bootstrap our Tendermint light clients. So 
how that works, you know, typically a Tendermint light client uh, with all proof of stake, we have that long range attack problem. So if, if your client is a little too out of date, uh, like you haven't gone online in a long time, then there's no secure way to get to the current state of the network without having to use like a trusted header. So that's kind of not great UX. You have to like tell the user to find someone they trust or whatever, some source of truth to get updated. But it'd be nice if that was automatic. And um, with Bitcoin proof of work, obviously we don't need that because as time goes on, the history gets more secure. So it actually complements Tendermint really well where our light clients first just sync a Bitcoin light client, then once they have that, they can follow all these checkpoint transactions. So that's why we call it follow the money. And they just follow that chain all the way up to the, the latest one. Then they just run a normal Tendermint light client from there. So a cool um, property of that is, uh, so like the Cosmos hub has an unbonding period of 21 days. And that's pretty much just for those light clients. Um, like that's the period of time you can be offline without needing a trusted header. But in our client, uh, since we don't need that, we can do unbonding periods of a day or less. So that's a nice feature. Um, and also just adding to that script we looked at, um, there's a proposed soft fork in Bitcoin called Taproot, which it's already merged into the code. They really just need to figure out how to coordinate everyone activating it. So it's, it's a soft fork kind of like what SegWit was, um, but it just adds some really cool things to Bitcoin. And once that's in, we already have a design for a possible way to do, uh, we can remove that limit of 76 keys and we can actually do any number of validator keys. So if we have a bigger validator set, we can get everyone in that script. And um, also it's just more efficient because the signatures, even though they're coming from all those different validators, instead of, uh, you know, 32 times n bytes or n's the number of validators, we can just have it be the size of a single signature, just 32 bytes every time. So, you know, if fees go up on Bitcoin a lot, that becomes more important. Uh, and it's also important to think about sort of the economics of how this is secure. So when people talk about pegs, um, well, first, I guess I'll say, you know, it's just kind of like, any Cosmos chain where, you know, there's stake, validators have stake, and if they do something bad, they get slashed. So in addition to just for double signing and things like that, we also slash them if they sign any unexpected Bitcoin transactions. Since we have that checkpoint process, we always know exactly what transactions they should be signing. So anything else is, it must be fraud. Like that would be like the validators colluding to steal money from the reserves. So to prevent that, we have this constraint where the value of the stake has to be greater than the total value of the reserves, which, you know, that does make this a little tricky because that's a high cost, that's a lot of stake. But uh, one way we solve that pretty nicely is all the NBTC holders, they're paying demurrage, which just means negative interest. So they're paying like a small fee over time to the stakers. So that means the stakers are earning Bitcoin revenue, which is cool or NBTC, I should say. And, um, you know, as Bitcoin gets put into the reserves, as people deposit a lot, the stake increases in value as well. They're sort of coupled together because the revenue from the demurrage goes up. Um, so that's, you know, it makes that requirement a little easier. Um, also, another security feature is, you know, if you're thinking about this, you might question, okay, what if the attackers, like, what if there's, more than two thirds of the validators trying to steal the money. But, um, you know, like if they have more than two thirds, then they're able to censor transactions on the Tendermint side. So if there was a fraud proof showing that they, they made an unexpected transaction, then they can just censor that and not get slashed. But we, we have a protection against that where um, when they want to unbond their stake, it's not actually released to them until there's proof that there was a checkpoint that removed their voting power on the Bitcoin side. So that means if they stole from reserves and you know they made some unexpected transaction, they won't be able to create the next expected checkpoint. And so their stake is effectively lost forever. They can never unbond it. So you know that's similar to slashing in a way because they've now lost that value. 
So another really awesome security feature we've added somewhat recently is this emergency dispersal system. Um, so the basic idea is that whenever there's a new checkpoint in that process we were talking about earlier, um, we look at the, a snapshot of all the balances of NBTC. So Alice has one NBTC, Bob has two NBTC, and the validators will sign a time-locked Bitcoin transaction that pays main chain Bitcoin um, to those NBTC holders according to their balance at that snapshot. So time lock means it's not valid yet, but it will be at some future date. Um, so if the system's operating as expected, uh, the money will be moved from, to a new checkpoint um, before that time lock transaction becomes uh, valid and, and validate that um, time lock transaction. So if the network halts, NBTC holders can still reclaim their funds. So it's sort of a nuclear option against uh, a liveness failure where after two weeks, everyone still gets their money back. Um, so in Bitcoin, um, we expect that 50% of miners will be honest. In most tendermint chains, we assume at least two thirds will be uh, will be honest, uh, greater than two thirds. Um, so in our case, only one third of, of the voting power needs to be honest to prevent people from losing money. Um, if one third of the validators are honest and see the other validators trying to collude to steal the reserves, they can just unplug their nodes. Um, the network will halt two weeks, the emergency dispersal happens and everyone gets their money back. Um, so because Bitcoin is so immutable, um, security becomes super important for us in a way that it's not for some other chains. Other chains can use governance uh, to fix a disaster. Um, in our case, there's no way to appeal to, to Bitcoin governance. Uh, so hopefully an emergency dispersal never happens, um, but these are just the sort of security measures we think about to make this all one step less risky uh, in the worst case. Um, so now we can talk a little bit more about um, how this compares with other similar Bitcoin peg projects, um, give you an idea of how to think about them. That's kind of frozen transitioning. Oh, there we go. Okay, so an obvious comparison is Liquid by Blockstream because you know, when people think of side chains, that's what they think of first a lot of the time because, you know, they're the ones who invented side chains and made that side chains paper. Um, but, you know, it's kind of interesting. People, I feel like a lot of people don't really know the details of how Liquid works and how secure it really is because it's very, it's really a very permissioned system. First of all, there's no real consensus mechanism. They're just signing these blocks and that's it. Like they haven't put any thought into it, like Tendermint. So, you know, really they could double sign and like have clients sync onto, you know, a fake fork and things like that, um, which is weird. Cause you know, this is a system that really is securing a bunch of Bitcoin, but also a lot of people don't know this, but you have to be on a whitelist to withdraw Bitcoin. And that's just a centrally picked whitelist. And um, it's like the only people on that whitelist are Binance and some people like that. So it's like if you want to redeem your liquid Bitcoin for real Bitcoin, you have to get permission from Binance. So it's like, what's the point of making it like trying to make it like a decentralized system if it works like that? It's kind of weird. And also the validators get picked in a similar way where it's there's no transparency. It's kind of just block stream picking some companies that are friends with them. And uh, like I've asked Adam back about this on Twitter and stuff, but it's like nobody knows the mapping of public keys to, you know, companies or individuals running the nodes. They just say like, oh, just look at our website. There's a list. They have like a big list of logos. There's like 30 or 40 companies in there, but there's only 15 validator keys. So you don't really know who's actually participating. So like in the event of some meltdown, like what if it got hacked and like, or like they colluded and stole the funds or whatever, no one would really know who actually did it except Blockstream. So it's just a little strange. So another one we view much more favorably that you might be familiar with in the Cosmos ecosystem already is TPTC. Um, this one is actually decentralized um, and just has a, a different security model that there's totally valid reasons for, for choosing. Um, instead of the single big uh, signatory set as in Nomic, um, they just have a bunch of little two of three um, signatory sets. So it's on Ethereum, you can use it um, via Peggy, um, though that does pre present some performance challenges that come with uh, interacting with Ethereum. 
Um, you all, they also use ETH as collateral, whereas we create a new staking token. So there's some some trade offs there. Um, totally a lot of great reasons to use TPTC. We like this project a lot. And just another comparison, just because WBTC is so popular in the DeFi world. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of people are aware of this, but really it's just a centralized company, BitGo, holding all the Bitcoin. So it's like, you know, a traditional financial institution. Uh, it is at least one step better than, you know, a normal centralized exchange because all the accounting is done in public on the Ethereum blockchain. But also, you know, to deposit and withdraw, they require KYC. So there's not really any attempt to be permissionless here, but that's, you know, one of our big values. And just to point out, uh, there's a guy named John Light who researches side chains and similar technology. And um, we were just pleased to see that he labeled us more favorably in the trustlessness spectrum here. Um, like we're, we have, Nomic has less trust needed than drive chains or liquid and rootstock, which are what people think of when they think of side chains. So that's cool. So now I'll just give you a quick overview of, of how it's built and some of the interesting performance challenges we face. Um, so in, instead of using the Cosmos SDK, um, we've, we've built our own uh, Rust stack from the ground up for building blockchains um, on Cosmos. Um, and we chose Rust because of some of the obvious security wins that anyone who, who uses Rust is immediately familiar with, like the memory safety stuff that you just get right out of the box. Um, strong type system. It's just really, really easy to write secure software in Rust. Um, but also we have pretty extreme performance challenges. Um, you know, when we're talking about one big zone that processes all of the Bitcoin moving around in Cosmos, um, that's that's a lot of transactions per second. So um, we'll talk more about how we thought about parallelism and just maximizing throughput. And also, um, Rust compiles to WebAssembly really nicely, and we think that uh, web-friendly light clients are uh, very important um, for, for the actual UX. We want this to be a system that people will really use, um, so Rust is a great choice there, too. So Orga is our, our state machine library, um, very similar to Cosmos SDK, but in Rust, um, like I said, it's optimized for throughput and specifically parallelism, so you can automatically um, you know, if Alice pays Bob and Carol pays Dave, um, those don't touch the same parts of the state. So we can process those in parallel. Um, so those are the sort of things that we're thinking about as we design this framework um, for just total maximum throughput. Um, and also when we were at Tendermint, uh, we worked on Lotion.js. Um, so we, we took a lot of lessons from that in terms of making simple composable state machine primitives. Um, and so we're also really focusing on making it easy to compose these and keeping it simple in like the rich hickey sense of the word. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and another component, this was the first part we made in Rust back when everything else we had built was in JS, uh, just because it's sort of the first bottleneck is the Merkle tree that stores all the state. So um, yeah, you could compare that to IAVL in the Cosmos SDK world, but um, yeah, we've just optimized it to be really fast, and uh, yeah, on a normal on normal server hardware, you can get somewhere around a hundred thousand random inserts per second. And uh, sort of our next step is we're planning to integrate with IBCRS, and that's you know developed by Informal Systems. So they basically built out the whole spec, and so we're going to try to make that into like an Orga module and. Uh, that's just one of the really cool things about Cosmos. I think a lot of people, when they think of Cosmos, they think of the Cosmos SDK because you know that's sort of the default. But the beauty of Cosmos is that really all these completely independent systems that can be built with completely different stacks and completely different languages, as long as they have the IBC protocol, then they're still part of the Cosmos. So that's really nice. And yeah, here's just some URLs for the repos if you want to check them out. Our GitHub org is nomic-io, and you'll see various repos there you can check out. And also, if you want to look at IBCRS, that's under informal systems. 
So now we'll just talk really quickly about how you can actually add BTC to your chain. Um, and there's there's two main visions we've considered as we've been building all of this. And they're um, you know using Nomic, the single big peg zone via IBC. Um, and if you if you want to do that, the easiest way to do that soon would be to use uh, you know our Rust framework, which uh, we're already building the library for interacting with for for managing reserves. Um, so in the future, we assume that'll definitely also be a Cosmos SDK module. Um, or right, so that's right, right. So that's the native reserves one, where if you can just have your own chain hold its own Bitcoin, um, that's great because it aligns. Uh, you know, the stakeholders of your network are, are actually the ones holding um, the Bitcoin. But we sort of think most people will use the first approach of um, just reasoning about Bitcoin that lives on Nomic um, via IBC. Okay, just to go into this for a second, uh, this is just one application we've thought of. I mean, obviously you can build tons of different things on top of this, like anything that you want to use Bitcoin, but uh, just an extra Bitcoin-y application that we think would be really cool to build one day is a decentralized lightning hub, where it's basically just one zone and you can open a lightning channel with the validator set, essentially. Like the validator set is the counterparty and uh, that has some cool benefits. One of those is that that's a big issue in Lightning is that inbound capacity is a scarce resource. So to open a Lightning channel, somebody has to lock up Bitcoin um, in your channel. Like it's still theirs, but you know they're sort of parking it in a channel with you. And so since that's a scarce resource, uh, you should be able to pay for it. Like there should be a market rate for you know paying interest to sort of rent that inbound capacity that's kind of similar lightning is actually working on a similar project now called lightning pool but uh, we think this could be a little easier building it on a tendermint chain uh, where you know so bitcoin holders can just or hodlers i should say can deposit bitcoin into this and then earn interest where it would be risk-free uh, because it's just parked in a lightning channel where there's no counterparty risk and uh yeah, then Lightning users can just come to this network and pay to get inbound capacity as needed. And it's, it's also uh, very nice to do it this way because, you know, in any network, a hub and spoke topology is always really efficient because, you know, in Lightning, if you have to go through many hops to route a payment to someone, then it just becomes that much more expensive. So if it's a hub and spoke and everyone has a channel open with that, then, uh, you know, it's all, everyone's always one hop away. But, you know, if we did that in the naive way where that's just one big normal lightning node, then that just basically becomes Visa, where there's just one really big, you know, central payment processor in the middle and like it can be shut down or charge really high fees or whatever. So we think that would be really cool if that was a decentralized network where conceptually it kind of seems just like a central node but really, you know, it's this permissionless thing and people can, you know, own a chunk of like the governance token or whatever and uh, earn the fees from that. Yeah, that sort of speaks to the value of decentralization in general, where sometimes it's really nice to have uh, this like logical centralization uh, and a monopolistic entity at the middle of something. Like it's great if everyone uses Facebook. The problem is, um, once that thing is built, it has so much power and, and defensibility in its position that you can't, that it can, it can start extracting value from the other participants of the network. Whereas, you know, the whole point of decentralization is you write the system and then it behaves exactly as you programmed. Um, so you can, you can have this central monopoly that um, can't decide to abuse its power later um, and still get all of the benefits of centralization. Uh, so in conclusion, we think um, Bitcoin and Cosmos are just a perfect fit together, um, sort of inspired our, our choice of logo. Um, you know, uh, we hope you agree. Um, it's, uh, they're, they're a perfect fit together. And uh, thank you. We'll take questions now. I don't think I can see the chat and 
is the question section. Oh, yeah, I guess I don't think we were live. I think it was a practice run. Okay, uh, let's do it again. You guys were, were uh, you guys were live. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so uh, if there are any questions, uh, you guys can drop in and ask a question. Uh, otherwise, we can just transition to the next talk. Or we can just go back and like expand on stuff for four minutes or something. I don't know. Yeah, uh, that's definitely fine. I feel like there's a lot more to say on this one. Oh, Nacho asked, what's the ETA on this going live? Um, you know, whenever we've tried to give an estimate on this, it's it's tough because, you know, it's always hard to hit timelines for something like this. We've been working on it for like two years now and, uh, you know, hopefully sometime 2021. Yeah, just, we don't, we don't try to really estimate it too hard now, I guess. Someone said explain it to them like they're five years old. So it's a Bitcoin bank, but it's decentralized. Like you put your Bitcoin somewhere and you can do stuff with it or earn money with it or whatever, but it's, you know, you're not trusting anyone. It's just this big network holding the Bitcoin. And whatever application you want to write, you can, you know, you can build whatever like DeFi thing with bonding curves and stuff, but using Bitcoin as collateral or, um, you know, anything you can do with Cosmos, but with Bitcoin. Someone asked for a comparison to Polka BTC, AKA X claim. Yeah, that one, that's a lot more similar to TBTC in that it's like smaller pools of Bitcoin, like a bunch of small separate pools of Bitcoin. But I think in X claim, it's, uh, it's not multiple parties holding the Bitcoin. It's just one bonded party. So it's like they could steal the Bitcoin, but they'd lose their stake. So it's still secure that way. It's just there's sort of more chance for failure like that but you know if you aggregate a bunch of them it's probably secure so that's kind of the opposite side of the spectrum from nomic where we're like one network where we try to put in as many validators as possible and like spread the trust out as over you know as many validators as we can and uh put all these efforts in for it to never fail for the peg to never fail rather than just a lot of small pegs Shane asked a really good question about the parallelism. Um, so Shane, we only run transactions in parallel where we're really sure in advance that they're um, not going to touch the same parts of the state. So it doesn't matter what order we run them in. If there turns out to be some conflict, then they don't; those don't get run in parallel. Yeah, there's a net or there's a uh, write up we have on that in the Orga repo. Like if you go to nomic github.com slash nomic dash io slash Orga slash docs or whatever, like go to the docs folder in that repo, then there's just one document that goes really into detail about how that works. Jim asked, is this like Ren protocol, AKA Nomix bringing Bitcoin to Cosmos? Yeah, pretty much. Cool. Thank you for having us. This was fun. Cool, thanks. Uh, we're gonna transition to our next talk.